connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. Welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Lisa Stromquist and I'm your host for the next hour. Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to curate, convene and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community with our goal to spark conversation, ideas and action. Since we're live, I want to remind everyone that you do have the opportunity, opportunity to type questions into the question box at any time. So we're going to check for questions throughout the session. So please don't feel like you need to wait until the end of the presentation before you start typing your questions in. Um, also, uh, please, uh, we invite you to share your thoughts on Twitter and be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. So today we're going to talk about connected care improving transitions and building capacity in home and community care for children with medical complexity. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about Connected Care. It's a new Sick Kids program that aims to improve transitions and reduce variation in specialized pediatric practice from hospital to home and community care for children with medical complexity and technology dependence. Uh, through development and testing of services, Connected Care is innovating to deliver three service pillars pediatric education, virtual outreach, and bridged transitions. So I'm excited to introduce our presenters today, Krista Kilty, uh, she's the practice lead uh, at Connected Care, Stephanie Chu, the education lead at Connected Care, Thomas Charney, strategy lead, Connected Care, Kate Langrish, uh, clinical director of pediatric medicine, the complex care, patient access, and Connected Care. So at this point, I'm going to pass the mic over to the Connected Care team and uh, they'll get things uh, rolling. Thank you. Thank you all and we're delighted to welcome you to this session and thank you to Children's Healthcare Canada for hosting this Spark Live. We at SickKids uh, are on the, in the early stages of implementing Connected Care and we have lots to share with you and lots to learn from you in this session today. We wanted to provide uh, uh, some contact information for our team. So it's Krista Kelty speaking, and I'll be handing um, the mic over to uh, this very capable team among us here at SickKids. And we wanted to make sure that we recognize that funding for connected care has been provided for the from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care from the province of Ontario. Go ahead, Lisa. Mute. So we have a quick poll uh, right now. So uh, please tell us uh, uh, what your role is. Uh, just choose on your screen the child, the family caregiver in the community, a frontline care provider, administrator, researcher, or other. So we'll just take a couple of moments and uh, people will start just clicking directly onto your screen. All right, we're closing that now. So uh, overwhelmingly, uh, we have frontline care providers as 50% of our audience today. Um, other is 25%, administrators 16%, researcher 9%. And today, actually, we don't have any child or family caregivers in the community online today. 
So I think we're going to um, we're going to move to another poll. And we're just interested to know where you're from. So Eastern Canada, Central Canada, Western Canada, Northern Canada, or from somewhere outside of Canada or somewhere else. It's good to get an idea of, of where everybody's dialing in from. And so we have, oh, 46% from Western Canada. They got up early this morning. And so Central Canada is 30%, Eastern 20%, Northern Canada 2%, and other is 3%. And uh, we're also interested to know which sector you work in. So hospital, home care, primary care, rehab, or other. And so hospital, 42%, home care, 22%, others, 17%, rehab, 14%, and primary care, 5%. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for participating. Now we'll go back to, there we go. Hi, it's Krista speaking again, and it's uh, really our pleasure to learn about such a diverse audience across the country. Um, we note that there are no child or family caregivers on the line today, so we look forward to opportunities to share with them um, as we move along, and we invite those of you on the line to invite, uh, to invite us to those tables if, if that's relevant for you um, in terms of what you learned today. Uh, the objectives for the session are for us to share the background, early development, and emerging outcomes of connected care. And together, we would like to consider new ways of achieving standardization of practice across the continuum and explore opportunities for increased connectivity in the delivery of care for children with medical complexity. We situate connected care at all times with the driving force, which is the mission to promote the experience for families in home and community. And we've had the privilege of working with Sophia, mother to Jalisa, who is a family advisor at SickKids and is sitting on the connected care integration and engagement advisory table. And Sophia um, openly shares this story that we wanted to um, bring to you today. Okay, it's just going to take us a moment as we uh, pull up that video. We'll also be sharing the links to the video um, after the uh, presentation. Um, my first nurse that I had that I had to train, um, eventually when she was comfortable with caring for Jalisa, I would go out and, and, and take care of things that I had to take care of. And on this one specific day, um, I remember I was pretty far away from home and I received a phone call from her, um, pretty much in a, in a panic because the um, GJ tube had, was blocked. So um, I had to unfortunately turn around, drop everything that was I was doing to come home to um, help her unblock the tube. So that was not, <laughs> I wasn't too happy to say the least when that happened. If connected care was um, around and available, then um, that would have been instrumental in supporting the nurse um, in having that uh, GJ tube unblocked, right? Because they could have provided her with the support that she needed and you know, walked her through whatever steps needed to be um, taken in order to have it unblocked rather than me having to come back home, right? Because the whole point of having the nurse here is to provide that relief so that we could, you know, as caregivers, take care of what we need to take care of. Maybe had um, a couple of problems seeing the video and uh, a little bit of trouble with audio. We will be sharing the, uh, the, the link to the video following this. So I apologize for uh, 
any technical difficulties. Okay. Thank you. It's um, it's Kate Langrish speaking, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of background in terms of the Connected Care program and where it's come from, um, and situate uh, yourselves uh, in, in terms of what planted the seeds for us to uh, move along this path. So many of you will likely already be familiar uh, with the term children with medical complexity. Um, as you're likely aware, this is the subject of much interest um, in pediatrics to date, um, as they account for a huge proportion of pediatric health spending. It's an emerging population. Um, really, it, we often will describe uh, pediatrics in kind of a pyramid format and speak to children with medical complexity at really the tip of that pyramid in that they are children um, with chronic and severe health conditions, significant functional limitations, often technology dependence, um, substantial family and caregiver strain, and they are the highest utilizers of uh, healthcare resources. So they account for roughly a third of all child health spending despite uh, the relatively small volume. So what we uh, hear and understand uh, is that these families are at very high risk for a lack of service coordination, um, and that in, in most um, health systems, the support for these families involves multiple players and often uh, crosses over multiple ministries. So in Ontario, for example, some of the funding is through um, the Ministry of uh, Child and Social Services. Some of the funding is through health. Some of the funding comes from education. So very, very challenging uh, for uh, these families to be able to navigate what has become a really complicated system. Um, Sophia, I think, uh, in her story reminds us of just how much care happens outside of the hospital. And our experience as a tertiary center um, is really with navigating care and coordinating systems within our walls. And I think uh, as we understand the needs of this population in particular and children and families in general, uh, we've come to understand in recent years how important it is for us um, to challenge our historic paradigms around what roles uh, we can play as tertiary hospitals uh, to support the needs of children and families. And so with that, um, we at the kids have had uh, a complex care program for roughly the past 12 years. But in its earlier stages, our focus was very much around uh, navigating within the healthcare system um, with a focus on, on hospitalization, both ambulatory and inpatient care. And we've expanded our thinking uh, in recent years to consider what role could we play as a tertiary center to support care a, a little further along the continuum. Uh, to provide a little bit of context uh, into what this looks like for us at SickKids and within Ontario, um, many of our patients uh, at SickKids transition into settings where they require home care. So uh, approximately 5,000 referrals are made from SickKids inpatient areas to home care settings each year. Um, and you'll notice from the map that's available on your slide that Many of these referrals actually fall outside of the Toronto Central Lynn. So healthcare in Ontario has historically been divided into local health integration networks, which are essentially regional networks that are each uh, responsible for operationalizing uh, their service delivery models internally. Um, this includes home and community care. Um, and so within each Lynn, there are different processes and, and significant regional variation around service delivery models. Um, so for families who are receiving care, uh, their tertiary care at SickKids, for example, they may uh, experience multiple handoffs in uh, establishing what a local home and community service delivery model could look like. Um, there's often opportunities for a uh, broken telephone or for a, a lack of translation between uh, the hospital care providers and the home care uh, providers. Um, and we uh, hear often from families that that uh, can create significant gaps and barriers um, and a, a less than ideal experience. Um, and so as we think about how we may uh, be able to influence this, 
um, we really considered uh, what role could we play in uh, providing greater access to standardized approaches uh, across multiple regions um, so that we can contribute to a greater sense of equity um, in quality service delivery in home and community care settings. So um, many of you will also be familiar uh, with the significant um, health system transformation that's occurring in uh, Ontario, but it's great to hear that many of you on the line uh, are from other provinces. So just uh, to provide a, a bit of additional context, um, the Ontario uh, Liberal Party uh, in 2016 um, made a significant change to legislation to the delivery of home care services with the transition of what was previously called CCACs or Community Care Access Centers into our, uh, our LINs or our Local Health Integration Networks. Um, we had a new government in uh, 2018 and that new government has uh, expedited a plan to uh, encourage even further system transformation um, it, with the introduction of Ontario Health Teams, uh, where the, the sort of introductory stages of that initiative are currently underway. Um, meanwhile, at SickKids, we uh, were approached in around 2016 with a request from government uh, to look into the submission of a proposal for how we might be able to contribute to um, better home care delivery for kids with medical complexity. Um, and we uh, accepted that challenge. We uh, were able to conduct an environmental scan through contacting uh, multiple hospitals and home care providers in uh, North America and the UK. Um, we had some, some great conversations with BC Children's, for example, and the Health Authority in uh, BC, and we were able to conduct a site visit to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and um, speak to uh, some of our colleagues in Birmingham and England, just to really explore um, what types of opportunities there are for a hospital like us to be able to, uh, to work in the home care space. We are the first to acknowledge that uh, we are not experts in home and community care at SickKids. It's not something that we've done historically. Um, and we really uh, want to broach this through a lens of partnership and working uh, with those who have expertise in the home and community care setting and at the same time leverage what we can offer as a highly specialized tertiary hospital who um, interacts frequently uh, with these kids and their families. Um, and so with that, uh, we launched an initial pilot phase that was um, more focused on education in 2017. Um, and we have gradually grown uh, the model of care that we now call connected care through a very iterative approach, um, sort of learning as we go um, and, and uh, conducting frequent uh, process improvements, small tests of change to establish where we're coming from. We um, actually don't know where the health system transformation will take us. And so we are uh, being very open to the possibilities and really trying to look at how we can build connected care um, as a, an opportunity um, to better meet the needs of children and families, regardless of the um, policy landscape of the time. Um, and so with that, I think I will uh, pass it back to Krista, who is going to share uh, in more detail our perspectives around the family caregiver experience. Thank you, Kate. So in the background to the development of connected care and the timing and the context of um, both the political and policy landscape, um, we wanted to describe for you the impetus for the work that's derived from the family caregiver experience and outcomes. And I will highlight here that the care map that was um, dr uh, drawn by Julie Drury a number of years ago and widely published continues to inspire um, the, the desire to move forward in improving experience and outcomes when we understand how complex the system is for families to navigate. So we will um, all on the call begin to understand that there are that there's an emerging and a compelling body of evidence to inform the need to integrate and to improve systems in the context of the child and family caregiver experience. 
Uh, some seminal studies are displayed for you here uh, on the top line I would describe in terms of a national profile, profile of caregiver challenges. Um, and this includes Dr. Al Cohen here from Sick Kids and others. Um, and I also want to uh, highlight the, a very important contribution to the literature uh, that Holland Blurview's team, knowledge translation team, has documented, and we at Sick Kids had the privilege of contributing to. And this is uh, a description of children with medical complexity, a scoping review. Interestingly, in that uh, scoping review, one of the only intervention studies described um, included the use of telehome care as an intervention. So. So while the uh, number of studies are few, the cumulative knowledge over time is starting to be compelling. And I'll cite not a seminal study, but a study that I conducted um, that examined the sleep disturbance of family caregivers. And in this study, we measured the sleep of parents in home care when children were medically complex and technology dependent. And we identified that the family slept 40 minutes less per night than their peers. And cumulatively, this is at least 120 hours less sleep per month. And so we, we hear from families that sleep deprivation is an important uh, contributor to their experience, even in the presence of home care. I want to, um, however, highlight that no matter what paper you read or families speak to um, in terms of voices that we're hearing, that across all studies, Home care is described to have its challenges, but families say it is universally appreciated and uh, they want us to work towards uh, improving service delivery together. Other ways of hearing from families, of course, have been the number of important uh, white papers that have um, been documented in the past uh, years. These are some examples of those that uh, have come from the Ontario context. And families themselves, um, strong, informed um, families that are reaching uh, all levels of government, all levels of healthcare administration, and reaching out to other families to build a collective voice to inform system changes with respect to their experience after leaving hospital. So to sum the current state of pediatric hospital to home care services um, that situated uh, the early days of connected care, reflected that there's an increased complexity, specialization, and use of emerging medical technologies. And so there's the challenge in home and community of the consistent delivery of responsive and highly specialized pediatric home care. And I share the example that at Sick Kids Alone in the past year, we have changed um, many, many policies about the way that we manage, for example, central venous lines and G-tube uh, and enteral feeding devices. And these kinds of changes have not historically uh, been well communicated external to the organization. We also know that families are lacking confidence that child's needs can be met, and, and these voices are coming to us in many ways as administrators, clinicians, researchers, and policymakers. And what we respect and understand, however, is that in home care, the way it's currently situated in the Ontario context, one of the challenges is there lacks a critical mass um, in any given service provider organization for the delivery of pediatric care. And so with such a small heterogeneous population of children with medical complexity distributed across so many provider agencies, when they leave an organization like SickKids into home care, um, we, we understand the challenge that it is to provide service um, in that context. And we know that improvements down the road have the potential to impact patient family experience and other important systems level outcomes as well. I'll hand it over to Thomas, who'll describe um, where we're looking at this from a development testing perspective. Thanks, Krista. Um, Kate actually already did a really great summary in terms of introducing the background to where this program started back in 2016 with a proposal um, um, that went into the Ministry of Health in partnership with our uh, Toronto Central Lynn. But just to highlight that, the proposal that was developed was really based on four core principles of improving access, connecting services, informing patients' families, and supporting the right care at the right time. So in March 2018, the program essentially went from development to uh, being funded 
um, and, and launching with an aim to build capacity in the community. Um, and this building capacity is a really key and important part of the work because we're not delivering home care, we're augmenting um, the existing system and the existing supports to care for this population in, in the home care setting. So we're working to build capacity through improving transitions um, via education, uh, virtual outreach, and streamlining navigation services. And you'll see that these very much align with the three pillars of the, pro of the program that we're going to spend uh, some time uh, talking to you about today. So the approach in, in the way that we've actually developed this program is really iterative. You'll see that um, each part of this program really builds on top of each other. And we're um, gathering a lot of information from our uh, key stakeholders being families and home and community providers to making sure that the way that we're developing and rolling out this program meets their needs. So in terms of the scope of the program, again, we're focused on the medically complex and technology dependent uh, population within the GTA and the program's got joint oversight between SickKids and the Toronto Central Inn, but involves many partners uh, through many tables, including our engagement and um, engagement integration table that brings SPOs, families, and our system level partners together. So I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie, uh, who's going to give you an outline of the pediatric education arm, and we're just going to kind of step through the program in the way that it's developed, and we're going to have some pauses at the end of each section for some questions and discussion. Thanks, Thomas. So our pediatric education program consists of two streams, one for community education and the other for family caregiver education. And across both streams, we have developed a standardized competency-based curriculum that focuses on knowledge application using simulation-based learning. Um, we've also implemented evidence-based teaching tools and pathways that are shared between sick kids and partnering organizations. Uh, so our family education program provides one-on-one -on -one teaching um, with families using a standardized curriculum, but that can also be tailored um, to each patient. So for example, um, if a family is learning subcutaneous injections for anoxaparin, um, we will teach them specific to the dose um, and timing um, for that family. The education occurs off-unit in a central location, and families have the opportunity to practice um, the skills on simulation equipment. This program started as a pilot with a small number of topics on a couple of units within the hospital before being implemented hospital-wide in July of 2018. Um, and to date, we support about nine different topics. And within those nine topics, some of them have multiple sessions. Um, so for example, uh, central venous line care has multiple sessions multiple sessions and tracheostomy care um, includes multiple sessions. Um, and so over the last seven months, as you can see, we believe we've reached pro um, approximately a steady state of 100 to 120 sessions per month. Our community education program consists of five different um, workshops that we offer multiple times per year. And within each workshop, we have activities that are planned that provide scaffolding to support learning and application of skills. So participants, participants move from case-based discussions to some hands-on practice stations and then various forms of, um, or various scenarios of high fidelity simulation. We've seen a strong uptake of this um, program from home and community providers. And this stream of the program has been identified as one of the indicators for sick kids QIP under safe and effective care. So we have set a target of 320 um, home and community care providers, and this is based on a 50% increase from 2018's annual numbers. Um, so as the program continues to grow, we are exploring additional ways to complement our existing programs. Um, so exploring the use of a mobile team to provide um, education off-site from the kids that um, will hopefully reduce some of the um, friction that we have heard around um, having to travel to downtown Toronto and actually come to the kids for some of the education. We're also exploring the use of virtual solutions to be able to deliver updates um, and refresher courses to our home and community providers. 
Um, and we're also looking at how we can tailor our existing um, education curriculum to support unregulated home care providers, as well as supporting family managed care. So we have a couple of poll questions. Um, so in your region, what types of educational programs are in place to support home and community providers? Agency-based orientation and skills training, hospital-based workshops, mobile outreach from hospital, patient-specific at hospital, or virtual outreach sessions? Just give another moment and you can choose your answers. Um, this might be, if you're only allowed to choose one, it might be a, a bit of a, a skewed response because there probably are um, multiple ways to do this. So we'll just give this a try, see what happened. So we have agency-based orientation and skills training at 43%. Uh, patient specific at hospital at 35%, hospital based workshops at 13%, mobile outreach from hospital, and virtual outreach sessions come in at 8 and 3%. And another is high fidelity simulation offered for home care nurse education. So again, just another. I have some uh, comments from the audience as well, so. So we might just close this. I don't know. It's no overwhelmingly at 60% and uh, yes, and sometimes at 20% each. So um, just so some of the responses from the audience. Uh, so for the first um, in your region, what types of educational programs are in place? Um, one of the responses was none of the answers work for us in Alberta. It is our children's home care program. We provide the education to support home uh, uh, home and community providers. And so that's, and did you want to take a couple of questions about this? Sure, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the comments for those online. So uh, we have a few questions coming in here. Uh, so somebody's asking, how are you defining home and community care providers? Are these provider agencies based or community home care providers who also provide adult home care? Thanks, Lisa, for the question. We consider home and community providers to be those who are delivering pediatric services in home care. So in the Ontario context, that is most typically a registered nurse or a registered practical nurse. Uh, we also know that there are um, teams uh, per, that include PSWs as well, so personal support workers. So, and so that's the population that we're focusing the education delivery for. Okay. Maybe we have time for one more question before we move on? Sure, yeah, so uh, our part of a a bit of a comment. The problem we're facing in Montreal is providing training for the nurses. The management of the cases is done through local community health care centers, while the actual care is given by different agency nurses. At the moment, we have a team and we're trying to organize teaching sessions with the hospitals. So some people are wondering how many dedicated staff are responsible for providing the training given that you are offering more than 100 sessions per month? 
Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent comment. That's actually very similar to the context that we're working in here, um, where the hospitals uh, typically haven't had kind of a formal mandate around uh, partnering with home care agencies for this purpose. And most of the um, education and training has been done uh, by the service provider organizations themselves. Um, in this model, uh, what we are looking to do is to really partner with the service provider agencies to support competency-based training for home care nurses in a very different way. Um, and so we've centralized certain components of that within the hospital where we're leveraging uh, existing infrastructure and technology such as the high fidelity sim lab that we have here at SickKids um, to support the competency development of home care agencies. The program, uh, because we do have a government grant to support um, some of the program itself, um, we don't need to charge for participation uh, of uh, the staff who are coming to attend the programs. Um, but there is some co-funding in that the service provider organizations continue to support uh, their staff to be able to attend the training. We are looking for um, new and, and different ways of being able to do that in the most efficient way possible. So for example, um, some of the technologies that we're supporting training on may not benefit quite as much from the high fidelity simulation. And so us being able to go out to the community and meet with um, agency nurses uh, at their local centers uh, is one of the ways that we anticipate doing that, as well as leveraging the virtual technology platform that we're going to speak of next. Um, but we do have uh, support from uh, our, our ministry funding currently um, for a team of, we have a team of roughly uh, five FTE of RNs who support both the um, education for uh, home and community providers the education for families who are transitioning home with uh, technology dependent children and the 24 seven uh, virtual outreach line, which um, is our next topic that we'll talk through now. Great, thank you so much. So we'll hold off on some of these other questions till, uh, till we go through the next section. Lisa, can you see my screen? Uh, I can see it. It's not, it still says pull the audience. Perfect. There we go. So with that, we're going to move uh, to talk about the second pillar of the program in terms of virtual outreach and what it's essentially uh, supporting for our home and community uh, providers um, in the home care space. So um, we've rebranded a little bit of this, so it rolls off the tongue a little e easier to connect to care live, but it's a virtual health solution that delivers um, two key deliverables. One is a 24-7 nurse-led consultative ser uh, service from SickKids uh, to support and strengthen pediatric expertise among home care providers um, supporting uh, medically complex and technology-dependent children. Uh, to note, this uh, platform is actually only available to uh, registered nurses or registered practical nurses at the moment, but we realize that there is the opportunity to expand um, into other areas um, in providing the support. Um, now, this nurse-led consultative service you can see um, is actually accessed through the Connected Care Live portal uh, where home care providers uh, receive credentials um, uh, to access the service. And once they've logged into the service, they can essentially access our 24-7 uh, um, consult service through both text uh, or telephone. So if they are uh, working at home at night, for example, um, taking care of a patient and they want to be able to communicate with somebody without picking up the phone, they can do that. But for example, if they're in a more rural location where they might not have the best uh, access to internet, they can actually just use a landline to give us a call and, and connect with us as well. Um, what we quickly realized in developing this arm of the program is that we wanted to move past just giving a, a telephone number to home care providers to be able to call. Uh, to get uh, access to advice. We wanted to uh, build something out that was a little more fulsome using practical uses of technologies and also give them access to specialized self-directed pediatric resources that are really aligned with the education that they're receiving uh, through the education arm of the program. So um, again, it's available to home and community providers providing a direct care uh, to this population. 
Um, and we've actually moved to a self-registration model where home and community providers identify themselves and register uh, for access to this service uh, through the Connected Care website. So in terms of timelines of how we've launched this, we did a short six-week pilot with three, uh, three partnering agencies, namely St. Elizabeth, uh, Safe Haven, and VHA, uh, SE Health and VHA are home care agencies. Uh, and Safe Haven um, is a community partner here uh, in Toronto. Um, and we registered about 40 home and community providers um, into the platform and um, gave them access to these self-directed resources along with the consultation services. And in April 1st, after we did some testing and got some feedback from our partners, we moved to that open registration model. So we're now currently registering um, between five and 10 home and community providers a day. Um, to, to this platform, and we're actually, uh, these numbers are a little old, we're just, we just hit um, close to 160 home and community providers today, as of this morning. So um, we're getting a range of consults from a range of agencies, so you can see some of the agencies that are accessing, um, you know, the virtual outreach service up at the up corner. And more, uh, more important sometimes than the number of consultations are we, that we're getting is the, number, the, the level of activity that we're actually getting through the portal because they are actually uh, accessing these self-directed resources themselves. Um, Chris is going to give you um, a little brief overview of uh, some of the consults that we've had to date because I'm sure that's something that's of interest. Thank you, Thomas. In fact, the consultations are starting to come in, and so we're receiving consultations typically initiated by home care nurses um, via text first, and then uh, often these consultations are completed in text mode, but they will sometimes then be converted to a talk, so a telephone call or a video if appropriate to support the consultation. And so not surprising, the most common reason for a call so far have been questions about either medications or about uh, enteral feeding devices. And we know that both medications and uh, enteral feeding devices are the commonest technologies that uh, are in, in pediatric home care. I'll provide the example that a consultation came through from a home care nurse who wanted to clarify if a new prescription for an antibiotic could or should be given via the child's enteral feeding tube. And in fact, the child she was calling about had both a G and a GJ feeding tube. And so the Connected Care Resource Nurse was able to walk through a consultation um, uh, with this home care nurse to understand first whether or not the order set was clear um, from the prescriber for the medicine. Uh, they were able to look at the sick kid's EPIC health record to uh, carry out uh, um, components of medication reconciliation. They were also able to learn from the home care nurse whether or not they'd given this medicine before and if they had any questions about the medicine themselves and make the recommendation and confirm that it was indeed okay to give this medication via the gastrostomy tube and, and also shared a link to the home care nurse uh, about how to flush the tube safely after giving this kind of medication as well as uh, the, we were able to push out a PDF from the pharmacist to all of the medicines um, that are not safe to be given by GJ, GJ tubes so that that could be shared within the team. So it's an example of sort of the breadth of the consultations um, and uh, that we're never quite sure why people are going to call. We're working from the perspective that our sick kids nurses have access to resources that are evidence informed and will consistently make a recommendation um, based on these resources recognizing that it's the home care nurse who continues to retain responsibility for decision-making in the context of the care they provide. We have a couple more poll questions. So is your region using virtual solutions to support capacity building from hospital to home and community care? Another moment or two. And I think I'm going to close that. Uh, no, overwhelmingly, no. 73%. And so 24% is sometimes. 
And which modes of connectivity are currently available for use? Um, again, this is one of those situations where there's probably multiple answers. And unfortunately, this uh, question is up as just being able to select one answer. So apologies for that. So I would just suggest you use one that is maybe most often used. So self talk, 70% and self-directed online, 21%. So we'll just- Thank you, Lisa. It's interesting for us to learn where others are at. Um, it wasn't that long ago that our response to that first question would have been no as well. Um, so we appreciate that this is a, a, a this sort of a journey for many organizations as we seek to implement the kinds of technologies that are now available to support connectivity. Uh, to move now to uh, an area of uh, program development for connected care that we're calling bridged transitions. So as a complement, but probably also foundational to um, integrating across hospital to home and community, Connected Care is developing and has been already testing a number of interventions in support of bridge transitions. In context of the family as the uh, population of uh, target population, we are uh, receiving referrals to provide one-on-one -on -one family education as described by Stephanie through uh, Connected Care Pediatric Education. And uh, within weeks, perhaps next week, we'll initiate um, follow-up for these families using the virtual outreach platform to assess their safety and satisfaction after discharge. And so we're just in the process of obtaining family feedback, family provider feedback on the questions that we've developed and the uh, implementation strategy that we're, we're looking at. We have a, a target, uh, target population as well, of course, of community healthcare providers. And so for that population, Connected Care Live is now, is now up and running, and we're starting to see um, early success in uptake. And, and we're also uh, receiving referrals for what we're calling just-in-time education. And this is when home care agencies themselves or families trigger the request that Connected Care support nurses uh, to be prepared for discharge by brushing up on uh, their skills and education before the child is discharged to home and community. And thinking about the partnership um, and what's so um, important and unique about the home care context, which is this long-term relationship between child and family, we're keen through Connected Care to support the early um, stages of that relationship and get it off the ground in a very positive way. And so with this, we're starting to test something that we're calling circle of care plan meetings. These are where family caregivers, the child, come together with their home care nurses um, and sick kids providers and connected care staff to review the plan of care, to understand families' preferences, uh, to ensure we understand comfort measures for the child, for example, and to be uh, getting that relationship started before the discharge. And then we will be implementing uh, in probably the next three months. Uh, we're just building the, um, the tools and the strategies to understand how to uh, implement virtual follow-up visits in a routine way. And we expect that these will be needs-based follow-ups um, and we'll be able to uh, conduct these virtually um, via the platform, ideally using video um, so that we can, um, okay, oh, sorry, just heard, I think I heard you, Lisa. Um, we'll be able to, to do this um, using the virtual platform using video so that we can talk with families and home care providers in the community and support whatever identified need um, has come up in terms, of, in terms of the assessment. All of these um, interventions will ideally be implemented in multi-modes and this will be to enable access for home and community providers um, as needed as we develop. So a very new, exciting, but large part of work for us to focus on in the coming months to year. All right, and we have our final poll questions. 
So in your region, do home care nurses meet and review a child's care plan with the child and the family before discharge? All right, another moment. So it's pretty close between yes and no, 43 for yes, 36 for no, and sometimes is 21%. And in your region, do home care nurses receive just-in-time support for patient-specific skills training? All right. Uh, no, 41% say no, and yes, and sometimes they're very close, uh, 31 and 28%. We'll go back to the connected care team. Thank you. We'll sum up and uh, leave some time for discussion, but if we wanted to share that uh, the connected care experience is, is aligned with the patient journey um, that we describe here using Zoe as an example of a three-month-old child with prematurity, subglottic stenosis, who undergoes the placement of a tracheostomy soon after birth um, and uh, transitions to home and community. You'll recognize on our journey map that uh, we include our colleagues um, and our partners at Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital. Um, as Connected Care develops, we recognize that it's both uh, an opportunity and a necessity, of course, to think about ways that the family experience is uh, affected as they transition across organizations and work as effectively um, in partnership uh, with these organizations. And Holland Bloorview stands out as one of the um, organizations that's come to the table with many uh, of their own strong ideas and informed ideas about how to do this well. So we've been excited to work with them and others across home and community. You've seen in an earlier slide that we're building an engagement strategy that includes at least 12 other service provider organizations across the province as we seek to work together to uh, support better transitions and so for Zoe, you'll recognize with the icons on her patient journey that connected care touches um, her experience across, uh, across this transition. And of course, connected care works in partnership, um, not only with different agencies and with the families, but with the point of care teams and the point of care teams, both at SickKids and then as they move into home and community, point of care teams uh, into ambulatory care and primary care as well. So it's a complex environment for us to work in, um, but one that is the real uh, experience for patients and families. So we're, we're seeking to, um, to integrate where it makes sense from, from that patient care lens. I think we'll end there um, and open up for the next uh, few minutes for your questions, but also encourage you at any time to reach out to us through connectedcare.inquiries at sickkids.ca. And please do browse our website. And if you are um, a provider in the uh, uh, GTA, uh, feel free to register for use of Connected Care. We'd be pleased to support that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so much uh, to learn. So uh, such a interesting, important uh, program, building capacity everywhere. So there's some questions here about future plans. Um, do you have any future plans to support other areas in Ontario beyond the five GTA? Um, thank you. That's a, a great question. We are uh, always sort of chomping at the bit to figure out what the future holds. And mm -hmm. we've built the program um, in such a way that it is highly scalable. So we know that there is opportunity to leverage the technology that uh, we currently have to expand where it's necessary. We also uh, work in close partnership with other tertiary centers in Ontario, such as CHEO, 
um, and have met with them on several occasions around how we can work together to support um, the, the broader population of Ontario. But essentially, um, currently our, our funding uh, allows for us to support the greater Toronto region, but we are uh, trying to build in such a way that we can leverage all of these tools and resources um, for more standardized equitable access to home care uh, in, in whatever regions require it. So do you have any uh, current or planned supports for other, uh, other ha allied health professionals such as PT or OTs? Hi, another great question, and um, we have heard from other uh, provider groups, including physiotherapy and, and other, um, other members of the rehab community. Um, and yes, at this point, we have included their participation in the pediatric education workshops that are provided uh, through Connected Care. And uh, as we move forward, we're seeking to understand how we might bring these other provider um, groups on to the Connected Care Live platform as well. One of the um, things we're proud of is our partnership with Holland Bloorview, where respiratory therapists will be available to partner with our Connected Care resource nurses uh, to support consultation. So recognizing that this um, group of providers also uh, offer terrific expertise that we would want to share across the province and that there are um, other asks coming to us, including, for example, support for daycare providers um, and other provider groups. So, uh, and I think importantly that we want to mention a commitment to uh, exploring how families will be able to um, self-direct um, and self-refer uh, self home care providers to connected care so that they can partner with us effectively and in, in a timely way. So some of these limitations in uh, delivery are challenging with respect to some of the data security contexts, but we are learning a lot about how to make that work. Um, others are just have a lot to do with our time and resources, and we will move along as time permits, and that around here has been pretty rapid rate lately. <laughs> Um, so somebody's asking, could you please repeat the ordering of your community provider education? Uh, there was a couple of things and then high fidelity simulation. The, so specifically the activities that we embed in each workshop? Maybe. So within each workshop, we, um, we deliver activities that um, will build on each other. So we send out pre-learning packages um, based on the topic, um, which may include readings and um, videos to watch. Um, and then when they come in for the day, which ranges anywhere from six hours to a full day, depending on the topic, um, we kind of recap content um, in case-based discussions um, and then move towards hands-on practice stations where they learn the specific skills such as stoma care, let's say for a tracheostomy or a trach tube change. Um, and then specifically for the trach and home ventilation programs, um, we do four scenarios in each of high fidelity simulation. And these scenarios um, also build on the, the content that was um, taught and learned um, in the morning. Um, and simulate kind of real life scenarios um, for care providers to run through in a safe learning environment, such as a blocked tube or a decannulation, um, checking vent settings. Um, so they will run through those scenarios in, in simulation. Thanks so much, sorry, we have a huge amount of noise in our background here. Um, so I'm just going to take one more question here. There's a, a number um, still coming in. Hopefully we can uh, address those um, maybe offline. Yeah. But our final question is going to be, in your evaluation model, are you able to capture cost benefit information and quality metrics? Um. That's a great question and certainly something that we spend uh, a lot of time uh, internally discussing. 
Um, so in terms of, we do have a number of uh, key performance indicators related to the program and process indicators that we keep a very close eye on. Fortunately, uh, the technology platform is designed uh, with a data forward approach such that we're actually able to capture a lot of the uh, process metrics such as um, those registering and logging on and interacting with the platform in various ways in an automated fashion as opposed to um, through a manual transaction. So we're keeping a, a very close eye on those types of process metrics. In terms of overall cost benefit, um, it is absolutely a struggle for us to understand where these costs sit across the system because uh, the costs are divvied up across um, all different partners within the sector. But we partner um, very closely um, with the Institute of Child Health Evaluation Sciences in uh, Ontario um, and some of our um, research scientists here that are engaged with um, the, the uh, complex care population, such as um, Dr. A.L. Cohen um, and Dr. Julia Orkin, who works um, closely with us here, um, and help us to frame uh, a sort of a, a system lens. So we currently do not have the capacity to explore that, but it's certainly on our radar and something that we're um, eager to do uh, more uh, evaluatory work in in future. much. Uh, there's, there are a number of questions, like I said, so this has been great discussion and hopefully we can uh, can um, follow up uh, offline to answer some of those questions. Um, any, any final words before I before we close off here? I just wanted to thank you, Lisa, and Children's Healthcare Canada for hosting this today and also for the interest for so many across the country. Please do reach out and ask your questions. We're um, learning every day, and we know that uh, other regions have already figured different pieces of this puzzle out in terms of the best way to um, support and build capacity from hospital to home care. So we, we welcome your insights um, and as well as your questions, and do follow up. We look forward to it. Thank you so much to the team. Uh, so. Just in closing, I just want to remind everybody that we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And we always love if you can watch live uh, as the questions and comments really enrich the discussion, just like they did today. But if you can't watch live, the recordings of these sessions are made available um, on our Knowledge Exchange Network. So you'll get a, a notification of that. They, they go up uh, shortly after the uh, presentation. Our next webinar will be on May 29th where we'll be talking about the child and youth mental health illness epidemic. Is it real and can it be prevented? This seminar will present evidence on trends in the prevalence of child and youth mental illness and suicidality and review recent research on health promotion strategies to reduce, to reduce the burden associated with mental health. So thanks again for joining us today and hopefully we'll see many of you back here next week. Bye-bye.